We are back for another spirited discussion about current events through the economic lens here with the FeeCast. And we are joined again this week with our glorious, fabulous panel of content providers and distributors. We have Brittany Hunter, Dan Sanchez, and Marianne March. It's been a crazy week with news. And I think the first thing that we really wanted to dive into is the rather unexpected, um, maybe close to peace in North Korea. And it's kind of been a whirlwind for us over these past few months with all kinds of tweets flying from the White House, all kinds of nuclear tests that apparently aren't happening anymore. What's happening in North Korea? This seems like it's happening very, very fast. Well, on April 27th, that Friday, there was a historic summit, the first in over 10 years between North and South Korea, where Moon Jae-in and Kim Jong-un came together along with other leaders and announced that they're declaring that there will be no more war on the Korean peninsula. So this is after the war that kind of had a ceasefire Mm -hmm. in the 50s. There was an armistice, but there was never any formal declaration of the end of the war. And now these two leaders are coming together, crossing this really funny looking threshold on the DMZ. <laughs> yes. And they're shaking hands and they're going to have tea with each other. And this is, again, yeah. very fast. Yeah, they had a very landmark moment where they took turns, each one crossing mm-hmm. over the border into their respective countries. Right. And even holding hands, yes. like just literally holding hands. It's remarkable. really, it's exciting. I think that we've been seeing little hints from North Korea for a while now that, in retrospect, now that we have that 2020 vision, that... First, we saw Kim Kim Jong-un being much more accepting of black markets, for example, than his father was. Yeah. And then we saw representatives from North Korea at the Olympics this year. It's exciting. And it was still, even though there have been these little little hints, it's an unexpected and great, great news. And of course, President Trump is set to meet with Kim Jong-un sometime later, either this month mm-hmm. or maybe early next month. We'll see if that That's actually... That's going to be fun. That, that'll be fun on Twitter. That'll <laughs> yeah. be fun everywhere that there's coverage of this sort of Will event. Will Dennis Rodman be there as That's well? That's a big question. The that. main envoy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting. And I think there are lots of things that we can take from this. And one of them is um, just sort of a mention of one of our uh, best articles on fee.org of all time, and in fact it was around before fee.org even existed, is by our founder, Leonard Reed. And he was writing about uh, a potential dialogue he was having as the conscience with his 19-year-old self as this 19-year-old self was laid dying on the 38th parallel, which was, of course, the line of demarcation between the North and the South back before the war uh, had armistice. And this is an imaginary dialogue. It's called Conscience on the Battlefield. We're going to have the link to the actual article in the video, so be sure to click on it. And it goes through sort of line by line, thought by thought. Um, Why are you here? Why are you lying in a battlefield in a foreign land defending ostensibly your nation and your country and your people against this threat of communism. What kind of control do you as the individual who are is fighting in this war, um, what kind of responsibility do you have for finding yourself here in this war? And one of the things that I think is particularly salient that he talks about later on in the dialogue, he says to fight evil with evil is only to make evil general, which means, you know, if you end up uh, trying to fight bad ideas with force, with military uh, uh, means, that you are then, in turn, making those people with those bad ideas not learn from their mistakes, not understand why their ideas are bad, but you're mobilizing them against you. And so the whole idea of fighting communism preemptively in Korea, which was, of course, the reason the Americans got into the war, the reason why we still have troops there today, why South Korea and North Korea are at each other's throats when it comes to nuclearization on the peninsula is because of American involvement um, going way back to the 50s. Um, This essay goes through point by point why you cannot shirk the responsibility from the individual, the self, and say, well, it was the president of the United States who sent me here. And it was a really brave thing for Leonard Reed to write because you might think that as uh, anti-communist as um, as Leonard Reed was and as uh, as Fee it has been since its founding, that you know a, an institution that's all about defending markets. Well, a lot of critics might say, well, 
that's what the Korean War is all about. You know, the, the communists in the, in, in the north of the country, that they are enemies of freedom, and so we should support the, the, the South militarily, and we should keep fighting until communism is, is driven out of the peninsula, but he didn't, he didn't take that position, that he really thought that it, was, it would be generalizing evil and that the way that you fight against bad ideas is with good ideas right. and not through war, which is its own bad idea. And, and inspiring I'll, individuals yeah. to seek that personal cultivation themselves, again, not through force, but through learning. Yeah, I was going to say leading by example, right? right. You, know, you look at the, the domino effect and that whole, that whole era and how much could have been done if we had focused on home and showing what we can do without having to meddle. Because like you said, good ideas don't require force, and trying to fight a bad idea with force is not going to help either. Right. I really like this quote from his, uh, his write-up of it. He says, war is liberty's greatest enemy and the deadly foe of economic progress. And so it, it is the enemy in liberty-oriented countries, for one thing. So the, the more we have gone to war, the more that the United States has gone to war, the more central planning that we've had at home uh, because of that, because of the regimentation of the, eco of the economy and um, mm -hmm. rationing, things like that. And in general, um, the central government getting more power because of the emergency of war. But it's also liberty's great, greatest enemy in countries like North Korea because the uh, assaults in terms of trade wars, in terms of sanctions, in terms of diplomatic uh, pressure, in terms of military war, that uh, go against a country like North Korea, it actually strengthens the regime. Like right. the idea is that it's supposed to topple the regime ultimately, but it actually makes them stronger because it gives them a bigger role in society by because the people become afraid of the foreign boogeyman, so they rally around the flag mm -hmm. and they give more powerful power to the dictator. Well, this was actually kind of uh, similar to a post that we redid today, that we reposted a piece that you wrote about Venezuela where you're talking about sanctions and how military and economic sanctions that the United States and other countries might put on these tyrannies, on these dictatorships, yeah. can actually help to embolden those very tyrannies against mm -hmm. the U.S. Look, look at Cuba. Look at how long we've been at war with Cuba. And quite honestly, if you're, if you're a Cuban citizen and you're sitting over there, you're, thinking, you're not thinking how bad your own dictator is because, one, you don't have a lot of power over that. No. It is so much easier to blame a foreign enemy that you can't see, but he's responsible for the reason you don't have medicine or you don't have this or that. It's, you're rallying the people together, like Dan says, and yeah. you're making them a more formidable foe. And this is one reason, like you said, the Cuban embargo has been such a miserable failure, yeah. is it's not allowed us to raise any friends on that island. We're not leading by example. Right. Yeah. Right. And it goes both ways that um, in, we're talking about um, war, I mean, uh, war it being bad for free trade, but actually peace is really good for free right. trade. And um, I think there, there's a quote that is often attributed to Bastiat, but it, it really isn't Bastiat, is it? The origins are a little hazy, uh, but the quote is that when goods don't cross borders, armies will. Yes. And there are references even as far back as Montesquieu, but uh, it's, it's so true. And I think one thing that's interesting to note about differences between North and South Korea. Following the armistice in 1953, North Korea actually started to rebuild their economy faster than South Korea. But because they took this policy approach uh, called Juche, which basically, which basically means um, self-reliance, it ended up crippling their economy. And then as we've seen, South Korea, their economy has grown much faster. And it's not just about iPhones or money in the bank, there are health implications for this. So I pulled some numbers for you as I am wont. You are usually doing that for us, <laughs> yes. always giving us the fact bombs. Because I think it's important to, to think about some of these numbers. So for example, infant mortality rate in North Korea, for every 1,000 births, 22 babies die. Wow. Compare that to their neighbor to the south, three out of every 1,000. And there's a height difference, too, isn't there, between people in the North and people in the South? Yeah, it's, it's a little tough to nail down some of these numbers on North Korea because, let's be honest, they're not always the most reliable. Well, you don't even need but... the numbers. You just need a satellite mm -hmm. view. Yeah. I mean, if you look, right. if you look yeah. at North Korea versus South Korea, you could tell just by the fact that North Korea is in the dark from, from space. Yeah. 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 Well, mm -hmm. we're going to get back into some of these other uh, elements of this conversation, but we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be mm -hmm. right back with the FeeCast. One year ago, over 700 students, scholars, philanthropists, and business leaders from five continents 
gathered in Atlanta for a brand new one-of-a-kind event, FeeCon. But get ready, this year is going to be even bigger. At FeeCon, we celebrate inspiring entrepreneurs, innovators, and wealth creators while helping you set your own path to personal and professional success. And it was awesome. All around, it's been like a vacation. It will become a must attend event next year as well. I'm not gonna wait for my invitation, I'm gonna invite myself, I guess, so. With FeeCon 2018, Fee is taking the conference experience to a whole new level. With eight incredible tracks, more than 50 jam-packed sessions featuring over 100 electrifying speakers and vast networking opportunities. FeeCon 2018 is sure to offer an unforgettable experience for everyone. It's the must-attend event this summer, and it's all happening at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in beautiful downtown Atlanta from June 7th through 9th. Available tickets are going fast, so register now at FeeCon.org and find out how you can set your path and change the world. And we're back to the FeeCast. One of the things we were talking about previously is you mentioned how North Korea grew a little bit faster at the very beginning of the end of the war when mm -hmm. South Korea and North Korea were different countries ruled right. by different governments. And it reminds me of a quote also from that essay by Leonard Reed that we were mentioning a moment ago, Conscience on the Battlefield. He writes, let millions be free of any slave master, let their energies be released, let them work alone or competitively or cooperatively as the mutuality of their interests suggests. And many people think they observe a great chaos but in fact, he describes exactly how that chaos can become ordered. Spontaneous can it, order. There it is again. again. <laughs> and we'll talk about that from, from Hayek. I think, I think it's important to kind of mention that quickly. What is spontaneous order? Spontaneous order is the belief that we don't need central planners, that in fact central planners inhibit our ability to grow. That when people are left to their own devices and able to, to serve their own self-interest but also create value and serve others, Peace is the default. And so instead of central planners, you have individual planners planning for themselves. And their plans are actually compatible yeah. with each other because they adapt to each other, they trade with each other, they cooperate, and an order emerges without having to be imposed from yeah. above. And this was pioneered uh, in those terms by Nobel laureate F.A. Hayek, but of course mm -hmm. it's been talked about for centuries by people like Adam Ferguson, Adam Smith, when Adam Smith was the talking about the invisible hand. The invisible hand is spontaneous order. Exactly. Yeah. Actually, you know, all these different forces coming together toward an end that they didn't individually plan that raises everyone up. But through self-interest, mutual self-interest, even right. if you want to call it that, we are able to serve each other's needs without yeah. authority. It's and a lot amazing. Of a lot of people realize that you can't centrally plan an economy but they think that they can centrally plan global peace and security. That's a good point. Um, and, and so the idea that we can um, force through war and, and power North Korea to, to, um, to liberalize is, is really wrong. So there's this great article that we have on the site called Want Peace, Promote Free Trade. And, um, and it just makes the three points. It says, first, trade creates international goodwill mm -hmm. because trade helps to humanize the people that you trade with. Unlike what we have in Cuba because of the embargo. Exactly, yes. Uh, second, trade gives nations an economic incentive to avoid war. And Unlike with North Korea at the moment. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, because you care about your customers and humanize them. And not want to bomb them. Right. Because you need them. You yes. need them alive you don't to buy bomb, your stuff. You don't want to <laughs> bomb your, your customers you, and right. you don't want to bomb your supply chains either. Yeah, out exactly. of it pure self-interest. Yeah. So when you guys were talking about spontaneous order, I was imagining our listeners rolling their eyes and thinking, how naive are these people? But I think that it requires more faith to trust that a person or a group of people can set these things in order. I think that's right. a bigger leap of faith yeah. than trusting that people will dig into their humanity and will follow their own self-interest to set things yeah, in order. And just along that line, I mean, that's, again, to quote Hayek, that's the knowledge problem, right? It's impossible for central planners to plan peace, to plan economies. They don't have all the information necessary. So to right. even... It's, it's pretentious, really, to believe that you can do that. Well, Hayek yeah. said the basic unit of planning has to be the individual. But when you go a little further up that, 
you get the corporation, right? And, and this week, there's actually been some news that perhaps one of the best known corporations in the world is planning on building one of their stores in Pyongyang. Well, they're not planning that quite yet, <laughs> but there's interest from Korea, uh, from the Korean Peninsula. And this in, is, of course, a McDonald's. That's right. Yes. The Golden Arches. Yeah. And in fact, there's, there's that theory that Tom Friedman had, the Golden Arches theory of conflict resolution, which is mm -hmm. if there's a McDonald's in one country, it's highly unlikely, maybe even impossible in recorded history that one country with a McDonald's has attacked another with a McDonald's, mm -hmm. yes. which is, goes right back to that uh, Montesquieu and Bastiat. Yeah. yeah. So to go back to the article that, Jan, that Dan just referenced, uh, Want Peace, Promote Free Trade, which is by Julina Dorney on the Fee website, he talks about a, an empirical study done by Patrick McDonald from the University of Texas at Austin, where he found that protectionism, tariffs, quotas, et cetera, actually increase conflict. For the countries that are in the bottom 10% of protectionism, they're 70% less likely to engage in new conflicts. If it's goods amazing. don't cross borders, armies will. There's, there's a quote, and Broadway does not always get it right, but one of my favorite... But for you, it but kind of me, does kind most of the does. time. I ignore a lot of it, but uh, but there's one line in a song from Rent that always struck me, and it was, the opposite of uh, war isn't peace, it's creation. And that has always yeah. stuck with me, even before I cared about foreign policy, because that's true. If you're creating wealth, if you're you know building a McDonald's, you don't want to create conflict with people. Right. It, but that's so interesting, too, that, that the opposite of war is not peace. I guess maybe what they're saying is it's not... Uh, stagnant, nothing happening, but a lot of activity it's, in yeah, creative exactly. energy. It's creative energy. It's 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 exactly the Bastiat quote, or what we're attributing to Bastiat. It's you're not going to attack someone who's who's creating something for you. Yeah, that's right. So isolationism, if if that's your only goal, that like, well, the two sides are just going to leave each other alone. They're not going to trade with each other, and they're not going to fight with each other. Well, that often doesn't work out because people start to think, well, you know. How am I going, especially because isolation breeds poverty, right. then they become poor and they think, okay, the only way that I can benefit from my neighboring country is by stealing its, its wealth and by, by invading yeah. it. So you mentioned a moment ago, Dan, uh, this notion of isolationism, which has gotten a lot of screen time lately uh, through a movie that I think mm. not everyone has seen, but pretty much the entire country, aside from a few people. Marianne and I being those those few people. <laughs> um, Black Panther. And something really special that we have coming out here in the next uh, couple of days. Actually, by the time people watch this, this is out. It's a new episode of our Out of Frame series led by Sean Malone, our director of media, and it goes into Black Panther. And it goes into why isolationism and the fact that Wakanda, the land that they're talking about, because of course this episode is called What's Wrong with Wakanda, that Wakanda is an inconceivably advanced civilization because it's so isolated, because it has no trade. It's practically invisible from the rest of the world, and yet when you go inside of it, they've got access to this sort of mythological mineral called vibranium that allows them to create this incredibly advanced technology. But the reason that we argue in, in the video that, that Wakanda is so inconceivable is the fact that they are so isolated, that they don't have those trading relationships outside of a very small part of land that they happen to occupy. And mm -hmm. I would recommend this video. In fact, we have a link to it right underneath the, the video here. And please check it out. Let us know what you think. I think it plays in really well to everything that we're talking about here today. Yeah. yeah I mean, when you have technology, it, technology alone is not enough. You need, you need trade and you need capital investment. And so mm -hmm. um, you really need to be connected to a global network and so that you can not just rely on vibranium, but all the resources, the complementary resources that have to be combined with the vibranium, if that existed, to, to create these uh, technological wonders. And it really, um, Matt Ridley calls it the collective brain. Uh, that the bigger the trade network, the bigger humanity's collective brain, and, and vice versa. And so you have really isolated, uh, when you have really isolated countries, the collective brain is so small that it really cannot sustain economic development to any degree. This goes back to when we were talking about Tasmania last week, where mm -hmm. the yes. regression happened. And that's actually referenced in the video as well. Mm -hmm. So I hope everyone checks that out. We're no spoilers, take, right? No spoilers <laughs> in the video, so you can actually watch it. We're going to take a quick break, and we're going to be right back with the FeeCast.
Hi everyone, I am Anna Jane Peril and I'm the program manager here at the Foundation for Economic Education. We still have one amazing day camp open in San Antonio, Texas that you can register for right now. If you are a high school student ages 14 to 17, local to the San Antonio area, then check out our program, Economics in the Real World at Ronald Reagan High School. June 25th through 28th, we have four jam-packed days of educational lectures, social activities, and personal development experience. If you want to discover new ideas, build friendships, and most importantly, have fun, then check out fee.org slash seminars. Welcome back to the FeeCast. We were talking before we broke about various conflicts that the U.S. has been involved in, in China and Vietnam and uh, Korea as well. And it reminded me of a story uh, that I learned when I was in college, actually. And this kind of goes to a couple of different points that we've been discussing. And I'll tell you the story. In 1792, uh, the British were looking to expand their trading tentacles in Asia. And so they sent a very high level emissary, an ambassador. His name was Lord McCarthy. And uh, he arrived in the court of the Qianlong Emperor. And this was an emperor during the Qing Dynasty, again, very end of the 18th century. And he presented an opportunity to the court. And he said, we would love to establish normal trade relations with you, emperor. And the emperor said, well, you know, uh, I'll think about it. And then McCarthy ended up showing him a bunch of the wares that the British would be able to share, including compasses, including other mechanical devices. And, you know, the Qianlong emperor was kind of looking at him very skeptically about this. And in the end, they didn't get these normalized trade relations. That's for another day as to how that actually happened. Um, but the Qianlong Emperor wrote to George III, who was the king of uh, Great Britain at the time, and he wrote to him the reason why he didn't want to grant these normal trade relations. And he basically said, our celestial empire, which of course was the way that he referred to himself at that point, uh, possesses all things in prolific abundance and lacks no product that is not made within our borders. Hmm. And that was one of the reasons. It was this internal and basic need to make everything within that country that made them feel like they deserved and they were okay uh, to close off their borders to any type of trade from the outside. Mm -hmm. And so this, this protectionism that we're talking about is not new. And in fact, the Qianlong Emperor believed that everything that Britain had to bring to them originated originally in China. It came from China and was only now coming back to them. So it was this hubristic idea that, uh, you know, we can make everything here. We don't have to specialize. We don't have to grow the market in order to make mm -hmm. our people prosper. It was very hubristic. It was also, you know, making him feel very good. But it set the road and set them on the path to a much more violent and um, not peaceful way of trading. Uh, between the West and China. So I thought that was a very interesting story to kind of set up something that's happened in the news lately, very recently in fact, whereby there's been another Twitter storm. As there always is. It seems like there always is. <laughs> but yeah, so um, a girl from Utah, which is where I am from, so I hold that in high respect, um, she has been getting a lot of critiques online because she wore a um, Japanese style dress to her prom, Chinese. Chinese style dress, so sorry about that, Chinese style dress to her prom, posted a lovely picture of herself, and then one person tweeted it, what was it, my culture is not your prom, and of course, this once again sparked the debate about cultural appropriation. Mm. Now, one thing I think is really important to remember, especially coming from Utah, is one, she loved this dress, it had nothing to do with where it was from other than that she admired it, she thought it was beautiful, the pattern was gorgeous. But also, there's a certain modesty about it that in Utah is required for school dances. So you have to have a high neckline, you have to have sleeves. I know that my mom was rushing before my prom to sew sleeves on last minute because you can't find these dresses. But here was this gorgeous dress with a gorgeous pattern, hit all the right specs, everything was covered. She thought she had done a great job, and now she's getting all this feedback that it's just terrible. And another thing to note, she actually did research before buying the dress, found out it symbolized female empowerment, mm. was really mm. excited about this. She did her research. Beautiful red dress. Beautiful red dress. And a very traditional color yeah. in China. And because it wasn't a normal prom dress, because it was this traditional Chinese color, traditional Chinese mm -hmm. style, cut, everything else, she's getting this feedback. And it kind of brings up the whole conversation, like you said, of cultural appropriation yeah. all over again. Who was actually 
beating her up on Twitter about this. Americans. <laughs> so that's the funny <laughs> part about it. There have actually been some newspapers in mainland China praising her, calling it cultural appreciation, saying, this is great. We mm -hmm. love that you're sharing our culture. Indeed. We have an article on fee.org called Cultural Appropriation is Love. Uh, and it's just making the argument that um, really when, when w it's examples like this, it really is expressing affection for the culture. I mean, obviously there are cases when people are mock mocking other people's cultures and that, that comes from a completely different place uh, and is a completely different situation. But, but yeah, the idea of getting offended, it, it kind of makes me wonder, um, sometimes it comes from a, a better place and sometimes it comes from a good place. Marianne, when it comes from a sincere place. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think is the motivation for people who are concerned about cultural appropriation? I'm, I'm glad you asked because I think it's important to give a little context for what the heck is cultural appropriation? Why do people care about this? And I think that people think about cultural appropriation as being the adoption of certain heritage aspects, whether it's uh, clothing or jewelry or language and those things being adopted by a majority culture without a proper respect being paid to the original heritage and people think that um, it's not harmless cross-pollination people who care about cultural appropriation see it as an outrageous double standard so I think that there's concern that when a majority culture is taking practices from another culture that they're just taking them to seem cool and there's not this respect being paid for people who have been marginalized in that community for the things that they wear like hoop earrings. But to me it seems that that would help alleviate marginalization. Like mm -hmm. it, it seems that if like we were talking about earlier that you know trade humanizes people because it mm -hmm. familiarizes them that it makes them seem less alien and so mm -hmm. it would seem to me that if there is some cross-pollination between cultures that that the differences are not so stark that if anything that it would mm -hmm. help to um, to reduce marginalization yeah personally I agree with you I think that when we talk about cultural appropriation the problem isn't that this girl wore a beautiful dress the problem isn't that white women sometimes wear cornrows. The problem is, is that minority cultures are demonized and they're not, and that they're held in contempt, but then people sometimes will want to use certain aspects of their culture to seem cool or to be edgy. But the people within those communities, they're, it's just their culture. They can't, they don't have that same opportunity to be cool using, using those things. There's also an interesting element to this about political correctness versus politeness, right? We have a video actually mm -hmm. on that very topic in our Common Sense Soapbox series where we talk about, you know, there's a certain um, general politeness that we should understand and we should appreciate and we should exhibit and express by not, for example, wearing this red dress as a Halloween costume, right? Because that's a caricature, that's mockery, mm -hmm. that is fetishizing this cultural element, this, this attire. On the other hand, wearing it in a respectful way, uh, being polite, understanding that this is, uh, again, going with the dress, something that can be worn for a formal occasion and given the utmost respect, that doesn't necessarily take away anything from the original culture. In mm -hmm. fact, that is then honoring it. And there are all kinds of, I think, very interesting discussions going along in this area. But the main point that I think about when I think of cultural appropriation is cultural appropriation is culture. Mm -hmm. Because there's no cultural mm -hmm. development. There's only static culture if there's not this mm -hmm. cross-pollination. And of course, it must be done respectfully. It must be done without engaging in mockery. But if you treat these elements with the respect that they're due, um, there's no removal of that element from the original culture that it came from. Yeah, you're only adding to your own culture. At that at that point, you're just adding it to yeah to your own. I don't see the the harm in that. But yeah, yeah it, go ahead. I think it's really kind of zero sum thinking because you're talking about you know oh well they want to be cool. Well, what's wrong with being cool? Like mm -hmm. do is it hurting your own coolness for someone else to to be cool? Um, and and I I don't think so because like you say it doesn't do anything to take away. And, right. and I think it gets at the heart of what property rights really are about. And that property rights really are about scarcity. And it's just the fact that certain scarce things, like this, this cup, 
I can't drink out of it and Brittany drink out of it at the same time. So we need property rights for that. Whereas when it comes to a certain type of garb, I can wear that garb and, and she can wear that garb at the, at the same time. Uh, and it, it doesn't hurt each other's ability to do so. And it really remi reminds me kind of of intellectual property, yeah. this, this notion that, that you own a way of doing things. Yeah. And, and, you know, we've talked about that in the past as well. And you've got a great article describing what intellectual mm -hmm. property is. We should put that in the comments as well. But I hope that she gets invited to China to experience that culture <laughs> firsthand. It seems like she's got a lot of fans there yeah. now. So, you know, maybe this will be a good trip for her yeah. uh, and see what China's really like. Well, unfortunately, we have to leave it here. I do want to mention one last thing, and that is an out-of-frame episode on jazz. And it's entitled the ja How Jazz Smashed Cultural Barriers. And it's all about how this musical form that is considered quintessentially American came into being by all kinds of borrowing and, and remixing and appropriation yes, yeah. appreciation. So we'll put that in the, uh, in the description as well. We're going to take a break here for this week on the FeeCast. We hope that you have a fabulous weekend and a great week ahead. See you soon.